All right, we're rolling. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to your favorite New York Jets subscription podcast, Badlands. I'm your host, Joe Caparoso, joined as always by Connor Rogers. We are fresh off recording our second ever rewatchables. We just did 40 minutes on Jets Cowboys 2011 opener. So if you're not at War Room yet, subscribe and go watch that. We're going to do a few more this summer. It was a lot of fun. So we're feeling particularly cheery after watching Isaiah Trufant uh, score game tying touchdown and Tony Romo, for some reason, try to test Darrell Revis with the game on the line. But for today's episode, we are going to talk Dalvin Cook rumors. We're going to talk the latest quotes from Robert Sala about the battle for the starting tackle positions and about Quinn and Williams contract situation. We're going to answer a few different questions from our discord and just do what we always do and riff about our goddamn New York jets. Connor, how you doing? How you feeling? How's the air quality? A few blocks down on Willow. I'm feeling good. The air quality is absolute crap right now. If anybody <laughs> uh, who's listening, whether you're in upstate New York, you are in, you know, in the New York city area, you're in Jersey, Hey, you might be listening in Canada. I mean, you know how awful it is, right? It's like, honestly, I went out and picked up dinner tonight, and it was like walking through a cigar. If you were actually shrunken down and asked to walk through a cigar, that's exactly what it felt like. But I'm doing well. The rewatchable, we had a ton of fun with the rewatchables, man. It's, it's the little things that you forget in great Jets wins that make them so special to go back and watch. And, and we were just sitting there uh in awe of the greatness of Darrell Revis and it was not the interception I am talking about it was a different play of Darrell Revis so that was really cool something that we started to test it out last summer with Jets Pats in 2010 playoffs but we're gonna do not just the Cowboys one we already recorded but a couple this summer because we have so much fun with it it's a quiet time the Jets are going to be a very noteworthy team this year where there won't be downtime which is a good thing so now's the time to do all those things but Excited to talk about some rumors. Um, no mini camp for the Jets. I guess they're happy with what they saw in OTAs. They have to report. Schools with, out for the summer. Schools out for the summer. I, you know, it's. I will say the reaction to that was just utterly ridiculous. I don't think a lot of people realize how early you have to report when you have the Hall of Fame game. It is insane. You basically, what it does is for these guys that work in the NFL and the players and the coaches and the personnel staff, everyone. I mean, it shortens your vacation by almost ten days. So I think Robert Sala was like, we're not going to do with the mini camp because we want to gain at least a week back and we don't feel like we need it because of the way the rules are set. There's only so much you could do in mini camp anyway. We'd rather just capitalize and have full go when we get here. So I, I was a little surprised by the overreaction to that, but I guess that's what you sign up for when you log on to Twitter.com. Yeah, I mean, look, it, it's kind of crazy. I mean, you forget when you play in the Hall of Fame game, like how much sooner everything starts. The Jets take the field in a game in less than two months now, which is kind of wild. And I don't know how many people are actually going to play in the hall of fame game, but preseason is going to come up very fast. So I, I get, especially with how veteran the jets are at certain positions makes sense uh, from Salah's perspective, because they're going to have an earlier than usual camp. And uh, he had some interesting comments today, you know, at year three of the head being the head guy doing the pressers every day seems a lot more comfortable. I think he's been, uneven with information that he shared in the past. Although I think there were signs of it getting better last year. He does seem to have a certain ease about him, which makes sense because Aaron Rodgers is his quarterback and it's year three. He, he has a little more experience and he knows it's in many ways a sink or swim year, but it's easier to feel better about sink or swim when Aaron Rodgers is your quarterback. Now, speaking of veteran additions, these are this is a rumor. There is not a lot of concrete evidence out there. That being said, it's rumor season. This is what June and July is for. It does seem like there's a better than good chance of Dalvin Cook not being on the Minnesota Vikings next year. He's likely to be available, whether he's eventually released, whether it's via trade. Apparently, he's going to be out there. And just like there were some rumblings that the Jets could be interested in Ezekiel Elliott, whether they came from Ezekiel Elliott, nobody else, the Jets are constantly being brought up as a team that could be interested in Dalvin Cook. And they're one of the serious contenders. Uh, kind of a surprising name. We haven't really talked about this a lot. We talked a little bit more about DeAndre Hopkins and, and other positional needs for the Jets that really jump off the page. Could they go get 
Jonah Williams if they weren't feeling great about Becton? Could they go get John Johnson or Adrian Amos? Uh, could, could they go throw a dart at another receiver uh, just to round out their group? Now, with Dalvin Cook, you would say, you got Brees Hall. Sounds like he's an alien and he's going to be ready to go week one. I don't know if he'll be fully himself, but seems like the Jets are expecting him to like be the guy at least by after the bye week, which is most of the season. You got Michael Carter coming back for year three, former fourth round pick. You just used the fourth round pick on Izzy. You got Bam Knight, who was rookie of the week down the stretch last year and showed some juice. So kind of begs the immediate question from a resource allocation perspective are the Jets going to go throw some money at Dalvin Cook? You know, he's not going to be a veteran minimum player. I don't know if he's going to get $11 million like some people are tweeting about. Maybe the the truth is somewhere in the middle. Cook, a thousand yard rusher last year. His advanced stats are not particularly pretty. Uh, it was definitely a step back last year. Our guy, uh, Rich Ryan in our Discord, tweeted and shared this through. 36th in DVOA. 36th ranked on PFF, 43rd EPA per carry, 45th in success rate. So the advanced metrics on Cook are not pretty from last year. The top line metrics are like fine. He's like 4.4 yards per carry, like, you know, 1,100 yards. You know, how much of a difference was there when he was in there versus when Mattson was in there? I don't know. The I'll say this. For me personally, if I'm looking at the Jets roster right now, and I know they got some money to move around. Their cap situation is, is fluid and gives them some flexibility. Adding a big name at running back and adding Dalvin Cook would not be at the absolute top of my list. I'd say, let's maybe go get DeAndre Hopkins and upgrade over the Corey Davis spot. I would say, let's get Quan Alexander back and bring in John Johnson or Adrian Amos to compete at safety. And, uh, you know, keep poking around on some of these other like thinner spots in the defense. However, I would not be shocked if the Jets are very much doing their diligence on this and there is a world where this could happen. Talked a lot about the Jets showing interest potentially in Leonard Fournette, Ezekiel Elliott, Kareem Hunt. I've talked a lot about Fournette because I just think it makes sense from a guy who is coming from a pretty similar situation with Tampa and a veteran quarterback like Rodgers would love a guy like that. You could trust him in pass pro reliable hands out of the backfield, tough downhill runner, can chew up a lot of carries, has played in a ton of big games. If you don't want to rush Brees Hall back, he'll come very cheap. You get him right before camp. Cook, a little bit of a bigger splash, right? Used to being one of the best running backs in the league, one of the more well-known running backs in the league. The Jets, I just get this feeling that they are not particularly thrilled with their depth behind Brees Hall. And that's why they used the fourth round pick on Izzy, but he's a rookie, so you don't know what to expect. I just don't know how sold this staff is on Carter or Bam potentially needing to play like a really big role early in the season. And if you get to Alvin Cook, I'm sure Aaron Rodgers, who came from playing with Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon, where they ran the ball a lot, and you had the security of having two different backs who could carry you up and down the field, would love Dalvin Cook. You know, he could pass pro. He's a good, good runner. Could catch the ball out of the backfield. Experience, played in playoff games. Did had some nice moments against Green Bay. And you say, listen, if Brees Hall's not right, we don't got to rush him back. You know who could get twenty carries, like three of the first five games of the year, and we won't miss a beat. Dalvin Cook probably could. So I could talk myself into it, pending the money's right, pending the compensations right. Although it's not the top of my list, so I'm a bit ambivalent, I guess I would say. Am I not? Am I going to be not excited if the Jets get Dalvin Cook? I wouldn't say that. But what what is the potential thinking here? Why does it just feel like, Cook aside, the Jets still have this itch at running back, CR? Well, I think it goes back to something we talk about a lot, and that's as promising as things are with Brees, whether they throw GPS at you, Brees looking great, right? He's obviously in great shape already out there on the field doing some work on the far field. I saw the beat reporters are saying the Jets optimistic will be ready for week one. This season isn't about week one. It's not. I don't care if Brees, honestly, if Brees Hall, they, they, he says he's 100% and the Jets medical staff feels like he's good to go. I'm not giving Brees Hall 20 touches week one. I might not give Brees Hall 20 touches in a game in September or October. Unless it's like DEFCON, right? 
where you're like, oh, oh buddy, like we're in trouble. I, you are, you want the best Brees Hall in the stretch run, big games, December, playoffs. How about playoffs? And listen, if, if he's good to go by November, great. I, this whole idea, I, it, this feels like to me, and once again, these are rumors. Like we're, we're just, we're kind of embracing the idea or, or having the larger conversation of, is this the Jets running back room or is it not? Because you have all these names out there. Dalvin Cook's the headliner as much as he is the one on a team. But you have the Ezekiel Elliott. You have the Leonard Fournette. You have the Kareem Hunts of the world out there. Dalvin Cook has the biggest name recognition right now in terms of most recent production because he's gone for, I think, 1,100 yards now over the last four seasons. Um, You know, obviously, efficiency is a different conversation. I think Cook isn't really a guy, isn't necessarily a game-altering runner. He's a good runner. And in terms of just how much of a difference making runner is he is up for debate, but he's a good player. There's no denying that. And I think with this conversation though, it's really about, do you have to run Brees Hall like that? And history tells you outside of a very few rare occurrences. And I think of Adrian Peterson always comes top of mind. History tells you, including Saquon Barkley guys are not, what they were the first year after the ACL. It comes back to them most naturally around the second year. Maybe Brees Hall will be different. Maybe Brees Hall will be good. But last year before the injury, Brees Hall was great. And I think the Jets' best strategy is monitoring his workload and touches and having somebody that you can rely on for the first two-plus months of the season while you're still getting Brees acclimated, while you're building, it's almost like a pitcher. I look at Brees the same way as I look at a pitcher, not even coming back from Tommy John, but a pitcher really ramping up. Pitchers really, they long toss, obviously, throughout the offseason, but when they get report early in February and they start ramping up, think about how much time they have, how much spring training starts they have, even really out of the gates open the season, You don't see managers working pitchers into 100 pitch pitch counts or 7th and 8th and ninth innings. You ramp them up. I think you need to treat Brees Hall almost like a pitcher in a sense that, okay, you're going to get what we would consider if we're running back a 2-3 to inning workload in September. Okay, maybe we'll ramp you up to 4 or 5 in October. And now we're going to take the training wheels off, the reins off after that. And if that's the case... Well, the answer needs to be, well, who who's picking up the slack? Who's filling the void? Cook is definitely a premium example because it'll cost the most. And that's assuming he's cut. Minnesota might still be holding out hope they can trade him. Now you have other options, as we talked about, that are less exciting, like Zeke, who's kind of fallen off a cliff here, like Fournette, who's, you know, been kind of a roller coaster of an NFL career. I don't know how much he has left. Hunt's an interesting player. Um but didn't look that good last year in limited sample size. So yeah, I think that's where the jets are at right now, where even if Brees looks amazing throughout the spring and amazing throughout the summer, you are going by the historic sample size that tells you it will not be great or elite this year. It'll probably get fully back to form in 2024 instead. And if he's an outlier, amazing for the jets. If he's not, what's our fallback plan and how delicate do we want to be with a young player that we have huge hopes for long-term, not just short-term, for a team that feels like they'll be running the ball a lot to not only protect an older quarterback, but to close out ball games that they're leading in. So it's an important conversation. I'm fascinated to know how important do the Jets view it? Do they view it as important as going out and getting a premium solution in Dalvin Cook? Do they view it as getting a mid to lower tier option that we talked about as well in the veteran market? Or do they go into camp and say, you know what? Is he a Banacanda, Bam Knight, Michael Carter? How about you show us something that you're ready to take some of these reps and we're going to keep our eyes on how Brees is looking as well. Yeah, I think you, I think you said it well. It's not, it's not necessarily about these first six games for the bye week. It's can you have Brees being Brees in December and January where you're pushing for a playoff spot, pushing for a division title, hopefully hosting a playoff game. Like you want him to be as fresh as possible. And he's not the same caliber player because few are, but we're fresh off rewatching the 
Cowboys Jets game from 2011. And the Jets lead back was Sean Green, right? He was awesome in the 2009 playoffs, third round pick. Everyone was fired up about him. He was going to be the next, you know, Curtis Martin. He's going to run for a thousand yards every year. Like that's how the hype was around Green. Like after he dominated those two playoff games against the Bengals and Chargers. And part of me still thinks the Jets maybe beat the Colts if Green doesn't get hurt in the first half of that game. And for the 2010 and 2011 seasons, after Thomas Jones went his separate way, because he was really good in 2009, the Jets didn't just say, let's put a young back with Sean Green to back him up. They went and got with Danny and Tomlinson, who was old, and everyone thought it was past his prime, and he gave them two really good years. And it's not an exact comparison, but the Jets knew they were going to be playing into meaningful games until late in the season, and they wanted this 1A, 1B punch that could hit you from both sides and wanted someone who was really proven. Then it was more about protecting a really young quarterback who needed a, a really strong running game and needed another veteran with him. Now it's about protecting a really old quarterback who you don't want to have to ask to throw 50, 60 times every single week. And if Brees gets nicked up, can you just throw in a guy who gets 15, 17 carries and you don't blink because he's been doing it for four, five, six, seven years. So it's going to be an interesting one to watch. They are, I do strongly believe they will add a running back at some point. I just don't know if it's going to be Cook. Cook would be very much last Dan Jets vibe that we talked about a lot that hasn't really came to fruition because they haven't made that like extra big name veteran move. That would be that. So let's keep an eye on it. We'd probably know in the next few weeks. Other interesting quote, two interesting ones from Robert Sala today. One that if you've been listening to this podcast, like you know that Connor and I from the second Dwayne Brown said he was coming back. We're like he's going to be the left tackle. He's, he was not coming back to compete or play right tackle. I am sure the Jets sat down with Dwayne Brown and said, get healthy, come back. We're trying to get Aaron Rodgers. You're going to be our left tackle. And he's like, yeah, I'm going to come back for that and the money. Um, and he's coming back. And, and Robert Sala was asked about it today. You know, could Dwayne Brown play right tackle? Because there's been a lot of chatter about Beckton playing right versus left. And his exact quote was, I have a feeling Dwayne will be a hard out at left tackle. Was asked to clarify on it and said he's going to be hard to push out that door. So the framing of that means that he's starting camp as left tackle number one. And Salah did go on to talk that other offensive linemen on the roster can play both left and right. That could be Max Mitchell. That could be Mekhi Becton. That can be Billy Turner. That can be uh, Carter Warren, although he's recovering. So I don't think that's really going to be him this year. Uh, saying it without saying it and not overly surprising. When the Jet, when he is fully ready to go and maybe Brown misses the first couple of days at camp, I don't, we know he's still recovering uh, like a lot of players are right now. The, the depth chart in Robert Sala's office right now has Dwayne Brown, Brown as a starting left tackle. I don't think that's particularly surprising news. He was just pretty forward about it. And then the second component to this, and, and Connor, you can respond to both here, is Sala was very direct that he has no concerns about Quinn and Williams and that he'll be good to go by training camp with the contract. And we have kind of generally said not panic time until mid-July. You know, training camp is basically what, the last week of July? I don't think the Jets, from a business standpoint, you know, you can put the football numbers aside and that there's still ways for them to do this, obviously, from a football contract standpoint. And it's the right thing to do from a football standpoint. I see no scenario they're letting this drag in the training camp. I could see it dragging in June, you know, try each side's trying to haggle another million dollars. It was somewhat reassuring to hear him be that forward about it, though, to the point where you feel like he's been in communication with the front office and the ownership where it's like, listen, like, we know this is something that has to get done, but it's June 6th. Like, we'll have this done for you with a couple, at least a couple of weeks to spare before camp. So two... I wouldn't say overly surprising things, but I think two relatively positive things that Salah was pretty transparent about today. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, starting with Brown, right? You look at that and you go, yeah, I mean, he's back. They like the veteran, you know, Rogers, they like the veteran. They like the reliability. They know that even if he gets banged up here and there, he's, he's a guy that'll play through it. It's just, and he's honestly, as Dwayne Brown, not earned. That spot, right? I can't emphasize this enough. We have this conversation so often in this era under Robert Sala. If a guy has gone out and earned something, and a lot of coaches in all sports are really like this, but especially, obviously, how much it matters in football, 
you don't just take away a guy's job for to replace him with the hope of a ceiling. So that's kind of where it comes down to where it, we have this, and I'll, tie, I'll keep it real tight this week. A lot of fans and media and hopeful people like to look at uh, things on paper from a ceiling perspective. A lot of coaches like to look on it from a floor. And to, this is Robert Sala reinstating that and, and over and over again, in my opinion. Dwayne Brown, if, if he's not the starting left tackle, I think all of us will be shocked at this point. Number two, especially now that we've made it to the June one deadline, just to feel even you know safer about that. With Quinnen, this just isn't very complicated to me. I mean, the Jets, the Jets were in a group project, right? With the Giants, the Titans, the Commanders, and the Jets didn't have to do any of the work. All the work was done for them. Now, if they had done the work first and got the deal done first, they might have made out a little better than the other people in their group. They might have saved a couple million dollars on the Quinn and Williams deal, but they're last to hand in their portion of the assignment. The good news for them is there's really no large spectrum here to move off of. Quinn inside can't, the Jet side can't, because it's all been done. Look at Dexter Lawrence, look at Jeffrey Simmons, look at Deron Payne, players that Quinn and Williams is grouped in with. All you have to do is go on over, ca- over the cap, look at the deals they got, and you're not straying too far above or too far below those deals and that's what Quinn Williams will get and that's why they're probably very confident it'll be done before training camp because there's no leverage for either side to stray from those if either side did it would be foolish it would be ridiculous so that's the the part there where it's, it's just not very complicated now it feels like we've gotten a little bit of an answer maybe what's taken so long it the Jets have been doing a lot of restructuring all the way from Jordan Whitehead to the void years they put on Uzama and Conklin's deals. They redid Carl Lawson's deal this year. We heard CJ Mosley in the media today say that it's possibly something his agency and the Jets have been talking about, but he's not really involved. But he it seemed like he was aware of those combos at some point. We'll see. The Jets have moved a lot of money around. They've opened up a lot of cap space. We know that Aaron Rodgers' deal is eventually going to be reworked as well. So you get all that stuff done. The thing with the Quinton extension, why I'm still not fully bought in that this has to do with it is because Quinton's deal will really affect 2024 and on. I don't really see Quinton's cap. Well, definitely not his cash changing this year. In theory, you could probably raise his cap number this year and dig into all this cap space you've made. So when you have all this void money, that's going to be on the books the next couple of years, Quinton's number is still manageable. But with the TV deals that go on in the NFL, this cap explodes every year. In in this era we live in of the salary cap of the NFL, and I know this really well because I am a huge hockey fan, a huge New York Rangers fan, the salary cap is one of the most discussed things if you are a hockey fan or or a hockey media person, podcast, or whatever it is, because they've had a flat cap. And it's a massive problem in the league right now where teams can't even really retain their own talent they've drafted and developed. In the NFL, it couldn't be more further from that where this cap explodes because of the revenue that they pile in, that if you like a guy, you have all the cap space in the world to keep him and all the measurables and movements and clauses to do so. And the Jets love Quinn and Williams, and that's why the Jets are going to keep Quinn and Williams and figure this out within the next two months. All right, I want to hop over to a couple of the questions we got in the Discord. And a guy we haven't really talked about a ton. Uh, we got a question from MG Jets 25 What kind of packages do you expect from Mecole this season? I've heard his role will be similar to Braxton's, but as far as the return game and receiving game go, do you have any specific call outs where you can see major improvements? So Hardman, I would say, and he's a guy I know you were a very big fan of coming out of coming out of school. He's a guy Lovely. who is just from a top end speed standpoint, is a much higher ceiling player than Brax. And Brax like was unfortunately just bad down the stretch last year. But prior to that was like a nice player who like was productive when he got the ball in his hands and like got the yards that were available to him and was a good returner. Hardman just a lot more explosive in the open field. And in this offense is going to have a lot of opportunities for very favorable matchups. I think he's going to be a big part of what they do in the, what I'll call the horizontal game, like jet sweeps, quick screens, uh, let him make a guy miss and you know pick up 14 yards because he's extremely fast. Run that quick speed out 
on third and two where Rodgers is rolling out and no one, you know, is just quick enough to turn the corner to get in front of him. Uh, it's going to be interesting because from a pure, like, wide receiver perspective, I would say he's the – I'd say he's probably the fourth best receiver on the team. I, I do think if Corey Davis is healthy – as a complete receiver, Corey Davis is a better complete receiver than him. I think Lazard is. I think Garrett Wilson is. That puts him down in Randall Cobb range. And, you know, Cobb's going to have what I think is a very specific of like third down package plays. So it kind of begs the question, like when and where is Hardman being used? Like what does his role look like this year, knowing what you know about his game and Hackett's offense, Connor? It's a good question, right? Because we can't, it's very easy to figure out Garrett Wilson is just your true number one wide receiver. You can move him all over the formation. He's going to run a full route tree. Corey Davis and Alan Lazard are kind of guys that will really, you'll see their uh, skill set kind of uh, pop off in tight sets where they could be these effective blockers and possession players. And then you have Hardman, who at his core is going to be a sub package player barring an injury because Garrett Wilson, Corey Davis, and Alan Lazard will get more snaps than him but offers a dimension of speed that really until Brees Hall's back to normal doesn't exist in the offense. I mean, Garrett Wilson's fast, but Garrett Wilson isn't looked at as like just pure burner. He's a more rounded player. Hardman really has the speed element of somebody that you just want to get the ball in his hands creatively. And let's not forget, you know, we know he was banged up last year. This is somebody that, in ju- in, just in 2021, um, was an effective player to have almost 700 yards. He had 59 catches and 693 yards while averaging almost 12 yards a catch. So, I mean, when you look at Hardman, this isn't some, you know, fun number four or some backup player like that. I mean, there were legitimate expectations for this guy, and he's had his he's had his moments as well. And, and you know, he was really starting to ascend in 2020 and then 2021, 2021, where he set career high in catches, targets, yards. Um, and you just want to find the creative ways to get the ball in his hands. And you look at 2021, just looking at the kind of routes he ran. I mean, it's it's not really surprising to see the bulk of his routes were screens, 27 of his 96 targets there. Uh, this is a PFF system. And then you look at, obviously, go routes, he ran eight. You'd actually expect that number to be a little higher as well. Hitch routes, 21, because he can threaten with that speed. So he's somebody that I, I don't really think there's limitations on Hardman necessarily. It's just a matter of how Hackett wants to be creative with him. I would think the screen game is where he would be the most effective because if you put him out on the field with Lazard and Corey Davis and have those guys blocking for Hardman, that's pretty scary for a secondary to have to handle because those are two excellent re- blocking receivers and a guy with the ball in his hands that can absolutely fly and has a lot of experience working in the screen game. So screen game, go routes, and then gadget plays is where Hardman's role kind of makes a lot of sense. And you're right. we It is crazy how little we've talked about him, but he could be an exciting threat for this offense that has um, a true – more of true vertical speed than both Berrios and Elijah Moore have had. Yeah. I mean, they haven't had like that pure, pure burner in a while. And it's an exciting element that I think is getting looked over a little bit right now, understandably so, because we have to figure out where and how a lot of these guys slot in, but to have that top end speed element at such a nice low cost. And Harbin's a guy who's used to playing with a great quarterback, which is also a nice built in uh, feature. It's going to be going to be fun to watch and should be a nice upgrade over what that Berrios role was last year, a role that got featured far too much down the stretch last year and really cost the Jets in multiple spots and almost drove Connor and I to insanity. Question from our guy Israel, DMS7. What do you think it's like for a team as young as the Jets to go from a plethora of different quarterbacks last year to now having A-Rod, who is a leader, knows the offense, being vocal in practices and in the classroom, it honestly feels like A-Rod is the OC and Martini Nate might have the same job he had in Green Bay, just doing red zone, and I love all of it. I think you're looking at it the right way, right? I, what's nice about the Rodgers-Martini-Nate dynamic is that it seems that they have a good 
working relationship and understanding of who is going to do what, right? Hackett doesn't have too big of an ego where he's going to try to step all over one of the, you know, best quarterbacks in recent history's toes, right? It's like when Tom Moore was like the Colts offensive coordinator to an extent with Peyton Manning. It's yeah. Stay the fuck yeah, out of the way. Yeah. Stay out of <laughs> yeah, Stay perfectly said. Stay the fuck out of the way. Let me do my thing. You know, no get disrespect. Me, yeah, no disrespect. Tom Moore. Give, give me some feedback. Give me some creative, you know, packages in the red zone. Give me some creative packages, um, you know, from a game management perspective, but you, when you have a quarterback at this level, you got to let it be his offense and let him do his thing. And he's enough of a veteran at 38 years old where it makes sense. And this, this worked to an extent for a year with Brady and Leftwich in Tampa too, right? Like that was Tom Brady's offense and Leftwich was okay. Letting that happen. Cause it was Tom Brady. And just like it was Peyton Manning. This is Aaron Rodgers. They've worked together. They have comfort with that. Hopefully hack it bring some smarter game management, bring some more creativity in the red zone, but it's going to be Rogers offense. And for the young players, quarterback's the most important position in sports. Quarterback is always, it has to be a leader on the team. You cannot be the quarterback and not be a leader of the team. The huddle is built around you. Everyone is going to follow your lead. They're going to follow your work ethic. Rogers knows the offense. He's been to a Super Bowl. He's been in plenty of big games. Guys who are young know who he is and they respect what he's done. You can see them gravitating towards him. So his word will carry uh, more weight. You, the situation last year where you had a lot of young guys, I feel like just like scrambling and looking for that. That's where I think things like the Mike White shirt stunt comes from. Like Mike White, nice guy. He's a backup quarterback. But people were on that team were just looking for someone who felt a little more mature and a little more like a leader. And they didn't feel like they were getting it with Zach, particularly coming out of that New England game, particularly with how he handled himself on the field and on the sideline in that game. And I've talked about it 9 million times. I was right behind the bench. and It was as ugly as you can imagine. And how he handled himself in the postgame presser, right? The guys hear that. They see that. They're, they want to be led. People who are not quarterbacks on offense want to be led. That's why you play the positions you play. You're a receiver. You want to catch a lot of passes. You want to score a lot of touchdowns. You want to tweet weird, interesting things from time to time. That's what receivers do. Running backs, you know, they want to get the ball. They want to prove that running back zero doesn't make any sense. Offensive linemen are a beast on to their own. They're big uglies. They want to block. Uh, they, they're going to act a certain way. They're going to band together. The quarterback has to be the leader of the offense. And it's got to be very refreshing and exciting for the building to just have stability. Never mind the resume that Rodgers brings, but the stability and knowing that we're good at quarterback. Most weeks we go out there, we have the best quarterback on the field. That's so reassuring from a game planning perspective and from an offensive perspective when you're in that huddle, when you feel good that your quarterback will make the right decision or can make something happen. It prevents what happened in that New England game where that game was there to be won so many times that it physically makes me sick. And it's why I do not care about any of this trade compensation or any of this stuff. Cause I sat there and I froze my ass off and I watched the Jets sack Mac Jones like nine times and Nick Folk miss, miss a bunch of kicks and it'd be three, three until the last two seconds of the game. And time after time, it's horrible. The game was there to be won, and there was not one person in that huddle who thought they could get 10 yards. There was not one person. And every time they would come off the field, they would go in 11 different directions, and Garrett Wilson would throw his hands up. There was no organization on the sideline. I was like, this team is absolutely fucked. They are not going to win this game, and they're not going to win any games of consequence with Zach Wilson under center. And when I left that day, and I've said this before, like I'm like, he will never be the starting quarterback here. It's just not going to happen with this team. It's done. It's not happening. Now you have the other end of the spectrum where when you're playing in New England and you force Mac Jones to go three and out because he stinks, you're going to feel like, all right, Rodgers is going to roll out. He's going to hit the comeback route on time. And then if it's blocked, if it's not blocked up and he has to scramble away, he's going to break out of the pocket. He's going to roll back the other way and he's going to hit a 28 yard laser to the secondary target on the plane. There's nothing you can do about it. It gives you a lot more confidence. So I'm ranting and I'm getting myself excited here about the Jets having Aaron Rodgers. But in any sport, Connor, and you talked also, even within football, you talk to 
a lot of different college players who played with great quarterbacks who have been alphas and the leaders on their team. What, what is that just impact in the locker room on the guys of having someone's with Rogers? I use the word gravitas in the huddle <laughs> just because of his resume. Right. I think it, there's a couple of things, right? Rogers is a very unique scenario. And Willie Colon brought up when we did the Jets um, post draft show, he brought up such a good comparison because he's, he's lived it when Michael Vick came, no matter where he was at in his career, you got to realize like guys grew up playing as Michael Vick in Madden, iconic Madden 04. Michael Vick's legendary, right? So this is a unique situation where Rodgers is also legendary, right? They've seen him on commercials. They've watched him in primetime. They've watched him win a Super Bowl. They He's won so many MVPs. Like he's just, he's that dude. He's, you know, a little different than Brady and Manning who always tried to carry themselves the classic, almost scripted movie quarterback way. Brady a little bit louder than Peyton, but Rogers, I mean, discount double check. Like I own you, like, you know, the long hair, he's, he's a different cat. And you got to realize there's a lot of guys in the league. Look at him and like as iconic. So there's, that's kind of like the first phase. It's like, you know, holy crap. Aaron Rodgers is my quarterback, like is my coworker, my teammate, our leader. It, I've seen him do it so many times that I'm going to believe he is going to do it again. With a young quarterback, and we've seen it how many times, whether it goes all the way back to Sanchez, to Geno, to Darnold, to Zach Wilson, there's always a feeling around teams, and anybody that's ever played a sport would know this. When you're looking, if you played a sport that has a goalie, if you played football and you know it with your quarterback, if you played basketball and it's really who handles the ball the most, most likely a guard, um, if the level you played at, like there's a certain trust thing that you have to build in where you're like, this dude's going to get it done. It's harder for guys, especially veterans, because I think they can become jaded because they've played long enough in the NFL to know certain dudes just don't have it. And they, it's almost like a sixth sense. It's hard for young guys to be able to build that same confidence and aura around a team until they do it. And that's why it felt like when the jets beat the Steelers last year in that fourth quarter, it felt like that was a big moment for Zach Wilson. And unfortunately he couldn't build on it, but that doesn't matter anymore because Aaron Rodgers is here. The Jets could lose the Bills, and it's not going to change week two. They're still going to have the same kind of confidence in Aaron Rodgers. The Jets can have an absolute heartbreaker like they did against New England last year on that punt return to end the game, and there's still going to be the belief in Aaron Rodgers. So it matters a lot. It goes a long way. Um, it's natural. You can't fake it. You know, Authenticity is so big at the position, how genuine you are with teammates. These things matter a lot. So... Yeah, it's it's a huge deal. It's a, and it also then obviously trickles down. You don't just you know have that for no reason. It's how you carry yourself in practice, how you carry yourself in the building. People might see Aaron Rodgers do something and they go, "Well, if Aaron Rodgers is doing that, then I, I need to at least do that too." When it comes to kind of work ethic things, or Rodgers is a guy in a meeting with how long he's played from experience. He he might be able to look at Garrett Wilson right and be like. Garrett, like you, you do this in the timing of this route. When I played with Devonte, he used to do this against this coverage. And Garrett Wilson doesn't look at that and go, "Oh, this is you know somebody I don't respect or trust or anything." Trying to change, I mean, he looks at it and goes, "Devonte Adams is one of the best wide receivers of the last five, ten years of football." Aaron Rodgers and him were an iconic connection. If this guy thinks that I have the same level of talent that Devonte Adams has, I should listen. It's a little different than. Zach Wilson, not to, I'm not picking on Zach. I'm just using him as the most recent example, being like, well, at BYU, we did it this way, right? Like at BYU against Coastal Carolina in a random game during the COVID year, like we did it like that. No. So that's a big deal. It's a really, really big deal because it can, he already, he obviously, has played long enough with Lazard. That's already built in. I think Rodgers, I think Corey Davis is on this team because of Aaron Rodgers. I think Aaron Rodgers really likes and respects Corey Davis. And then we know the type of talent that Garrett Wilson is. So it just goes a long way. And it, it goes back to seeing so many different things where when that headset cuts off to your coordinator, 
Are you panicking? No, because Rodgers might see a coverage or he might see a look in the box and go, I'm going to check out of this play and go to this because I know exactly what they're doing. So it's long-winded, but it's a huge deal in the NFL. Yeah, it's it's going to be night and day, and it's exciting, man. Uh, it, it really is, and we're going to start. You know, it's nice to see all the the clips and OTAs, and they'll be fun in training camp. I I don't know how the Jets are going to handle Rodgers in the preseason. We'll see. I, I think if he does play, it'll be a very very small amount. But to see it when it really is happening in prime time is going to be uh, incredibly exciting. So, I'm going to close with. A few quick PSA reminders. We're watchables, Jets Dallas, live on the feed now. Live for War Room. Fun one. We're going to do two more in July for War Room. Eventually, they'll go live for Deep Dive, but check them out. Upgrade. We're keeping the content cranking there. Uh, Connor also has a film room on Joe Tittman that's excellent that you should watch that's available for for Deep Dive and War Room. Uh, We're going to be doing some more extensive video content uh, in the later parts of July and our season preview guide, which we'll be building on again and our CMS with Dan. And then we're actually going to have it as a downloadable PDF, uh, as well. So that's a bigger project we're working on here in June. Your badland boys are, you know, the, the, we're, we're not just Hoboken guys. We're, we're men of the world. We're Renaissance men, if you will. So Connor is going to be in Europe all next week. So I will be on the feed with other friends of the brand and other guests as we're going to mix some more people in here. And then the week after, I will be in Europe at Cannes for my other real job, uh, as much as I love this job, uh, for the festival out there. So I'm going to be gone in the early part of the week. So Connor will be on the feed with a few other uh, guests. And we'll have plenty of other content rolling, including a new podcast from Dan that we're really, really excited about to complement the work we're doing here. So you'll you'll hear a mix of different voices around Connor and myself the next two weeks. And then we'll gloriously reunite right before 4th of July, uh, to get some more content in. And then, you know, July, a couple more videos. And then what's really going to be just pedal to the metal, uh, camp coverage, preseason watch party, uh, preseason reaction. And then we're going to be into our normal, you know, coverage that you guys are so used to in season. So we're we're excited about it. We're strategically planning our trips to Europe in what is allegedly the quietest part of the NFL calendar. Although I thought – Whenever we travel, something happens. I was in a hotel oh, room at yeah. I was in a hotel room at one in the morning in London last year, calling Connor to talk about Elijah Moore requesting a trade. So things things happen, but we'll we'll be on it uh, because we both won't be in Europe at the same time. We're gonna we're gonna divide and conquer our, uh, our trips. So that's how dedicated we are. That's the dedic- That's the dedication right there. It's the dedication, uh, and the feed's been busy, and we'll continue to be busy, and it's been. It's been very nice to stay very comfortably above that that 2,400 patron number, which we expect to soon be 2,500 and then inch closer and closer to 3,000 as the season gets here. Uh, working on some redesign for myself around some of the podcast studio stuff. I got some awesome frame pictures from our guy, Matt Giannassis. So has that stuff is like framed and up behind me. I have a new one on Sauce, Garrett Wilson, and Aaron Rodgers that will all be behind me so you don't just have to look at this weird white wall when we're doing videos so i'm rambling but a lot of stuff coming and tell a friend you know we we only we pick and choose our spots on twitter uh we're trying to be more active in the discord uh, but but spread the word before the season gets here because we got the content flowing and we appreciate all the support and engagement and and just like that we have went uh 44 minutes here after doing a 40 minute rewatchable so <laughs> A full Tuesday night where my wife thinks I probably fell out the window. I was just going to say, my hours. Europe's canceled. My fiance definitely just left me. But we, Tuesday nights, we do hours and hours of Jets content in June. We are truly sick human beings. That's It feels like the longest episodes are in the quietest part of the calendar, which maybe we is just go on. We just ramble. Yeah, which is good. It's fun. I mean, even feed's not going to be empty. I'll, I'll, I'll pre-tape film rooms. We'll be... We'll be steady rocking. Nothing changes even when we go on vacation. It's just how things go. Badlands comes alive when the games stop being played. Exactly. That's how we've been trained over the last 12 years. So thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, We will talk to you soon. Stay tuned on this feed. More content coming uh, as the weekend gets here. So uh, we will talk to you soon.